Have you ever described someone or given a compliment that someone is fiercely independent? What if we were to switch that idea around? Hi, and welcome to Magnify, an LDS Living podcast where we cheer, inspire, and embolden each other as women and followers of Christ. We hope to use our influence to make a difference in the world. I'm your host, Katherine Davis, a mom, a seminary teacher, and a grilling enthusiast who loves God. What if I told you you don't have to be superwoman and do it all on your own? As human beings, we're designed for radical dependence and connection. God intended for us to need each other. Today's guest, Jenna Erickson, has said that because of our divine heritage, we're designed for connection with God and with each other not for the independent society sometimes celebrates. Instead of fiercely independent, we can learn to be fiercely dependent on our relationships with God and with each other, because that's how we meant it to be. And I'm so excited you're here. Jeanette, like this is going to be a great conversation. So thanks for being here. So good to be here. Thanks for what you're doing for women. Well, before we kind of get into today's discussion, I have some questions to go ahead and ask you. Are you ready? Yes, I think. (laughs) No, they're fun questions. This first one kind of blew my mind a little bit. You grew up in a family with 11 children. 11? Yes. Yes. I'm right in the middle. You're the fifth of 11. Yeah. As a mom now yourself. Do you look back and think, wow, mom and dad, like, how did you do that? What stands out to you about your parents now that you're a mom? Oh, they, it's, of course, it's that feeling. (laughs) I marvel at their absolute devotion to us. Every earnest desire was to help us to grow and experience God and experience what we needed in order to be servants in his hands. So what were some of your favorite things that you did with your family and now that you do with your kids? Yeah. My parents made a very sincere effort to travel with us to places. We have this hideous camper. Like it it is it is unspeakably hideous. And was yet, it brown? Okay, I guess it could have been brown. It's sort of brown red, the fake okay. trim. Inside, you know, you're like fake wood, that wood trim, you know, this just, and, but we felt so much joy just being all together. This I also think is really fascinating because you have a very varied and interesting educational background. You received a bachelor's degree in nursing, a master's degree in linguistics, and a PhD in family social science. So these sound like they're very different pursuits. But is there is there <laughs> is anything there you meaning? <laughs> yeah. Is there any common thread through <laughs> any of those three? So such a oh Catherine, I, I love talking to students about this because so many of them are in that question of like, what do I study? We have this strong sense of like there's a mission in my life. And I think that's a beautiful idea, and I've got to find it. And so I tell them my story and they're like, so what was your mission? <laughs> and and I, I think what's beautiful is I can say when I studied nursing, it was really good for my brain, that process of learning how to understand the body. And, but I started practicing as a nurse and I immediately thought there's something about me that's not made for this. And, and that led to, I met these wonderful women who were teaching English to foreign students, to non-English speakers at BYU. And I just thought they were the most amazing women that I had known, some of them. And I mm-hmm. thought, I want to study that. I'd had experiences as a child in Mexico for one year with my family. And I knew I loved interacting with other cultures. And so that led to, to working on a master's degree in that. And it took me to different parts of the world. And it was interesting that at the core of whether it was nursing or whether it was language acquisition and the development of the mind that way were these core relationships of family life that shape our health and well-being and shape our development and our connection to others. And so when I attended a conference and it led me into family science, it was like, of course, of course, all my education has been pointing to the importance of these core relationships in our lives. What a journey. Yeah, it was a journey. (laughs) 
you guys had so many wonderful experiences. Well, I feel like everything that you've learned all led to this beautiful BYU devotional address that you gave. Mm. And I just want to dig into that a little with you. You said this in your talk that I want to start out with. You said, though our culture may tell us otherwise, we are not designed for self-actualized pleasure-seeking autonomy. We are deeply relational beings designed not for independence, but for radical dependence and connection. Can you just tell me a little bit more about what you mean when you said we're designed for radical dependence and connection? Yeah, Catherine. So I think just culturally and in my education, there's been a very strong orientation to the goal of life is to be able to pursue pleasure at will, Mm -hmm. to be free, to be autonomous. Like a successful life is not unlike the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where it's the pyramid and I'm at the top and I don't need others. I have what I need and I can pursue pleasure at will when I want to, how I want to. And the reality is our culture is suffering profoundly. We have a higher rate of deaths of despair. There's tremendous mental health struggles, anxiety, depression. Our adolescents and young adults are less happy than they have been in generations relative to other generations. For me, it's been this discovery that we actually are designed for deep relationships. And the goal is not actually the top of the pyramid. And interestingly, in in the Lord's language, the goal is the tree. So we have not a pyramid shape, but the tree of life, which is these webs of interconnection and ceiling and roots and branches brought together, which is who we are as human beings. So when you think of an infant in the womb, radically dependent on another life, we don't come into being except through the literal body, life, blood of a mother who builds our own. And then we're born. And the first thing we have to do is we have to establish a relationship of connection with another human being who will care and respond to us. So in linguistics, it was interesting to study that you cannot learn language apart from relationship. That was my first kind of, wow, what is the power of relationship in our development? And beginning from from that infancy period, it's from within that connected relationship where a baby cannot regulate their own emotions. They can't establish a sense of identity. It happens through her eyes, looking at her and touching her and feeling her. And in the process, we now know, we can watch through MRI research, that mother's interaction is literally building the right brain of that baby, which is the center of identity and well-being and emotional understanding. And so that's radical dependence. Then we grow up and we, we have to, at some point, we're shaped by all of these people who help us understand what is good and what is right and who we are. But the goal, of course, is for us to become beings who can act out of love for others. We're doing things so that others will make us feel okay, but we're actually the source of love for them. And they are radically dependent in a sense. And then you find out that that infant is then spoon feeding the mother who gave them life in this remarkable process of interdependence. And I'll never forget hearing this woman who was a gifted uh, journalist. People would say she knew everything inside the Beltway in DC better than anybody. And she's diagnosed with terminal cancer at 40. And it was just a tragedy. It was like this profound loss of talent and capacity. And her very last writing isn't about what was happening in the Beltway. It was about her children, her two children. So someone writing about it and commenting on that said, we learn that through situations like this, that life isn't everything. Our children aren't everything. Relationships aren't everything. They are the only thing. They are, they are the essence of being. These deep wave webs of connection, love, meaning. And so we've really done a number on ourselves culturally by ignoring the essence of who we are and pretending that this is about isolated, autonomous pleasure-seeking, 
Yeah, because it seems like we're told to raise our children to launch, that our job is to help make them independent. I have a son who's about to graduate and, you know, that is kind of what I've been taught, try and raise him so he can be independent. Do you see independence at all in your version of radical dependence or where does that come into play? Yeah, such a beautiful question, Catherine, because I think when we think about independence, it's very important, the capacity to care for oneself so that you can offer that to others. But it's not independence for the sake of independence, me being independent of relationships so I can pursue what I want at will. It doesn't lead to happiness. So what is it in relation to? So it's independence in the sense of the capacity to be in deep relationship with others, to offer love. So I think what we find out is we grow up and I, I, I'm a new mom. I'd been studying motherhood for forever. Like I was going to be awesome. I had my list. I had a PhD and I think our daughter, the first date, literally, I think she was, she looked at me and she was like, I am not carrying out your agenda, mom. Like I just, oh yeah. I was a good mom until I had kids. (laughs) Totally. totally. (laughs) Oh, and here I am with my PhD, right? And I'd wake up after being a mom and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and be like, what was I teaching them? Like I, like this, this is so, and, and so what's interesting is I found that I was using my children to make me feel okay. Like they needed to be these things so that I was okay. And that's not independence, right? That's a dependence that sort of manifests itself in in using other people to manage my own sense of myself. So when I think we talk about independence, we're talking about acting with integrity in your life where you are doing and being good for the sake of goodness, making choices apart from what pressures are. It's what you're doing as a seminary teacher. You're helping them learn to act with integrity and truth, not to act in a way that I'm, I'm pressuring or I'm accommodating what other people want me to do because I need that to feel okay about me. It's, it's acting from a real place of integrity. And I think when we are there, like that's, what's God try, that's what God is trying to help us develop because that is a place of pure love. He is the most independent of all in the sense that he is not dependent on others to manage his own sense of himself. He's able to love with absolute purity. I'm still working on that. I'm still working on what it means to truly love. And that means independence from other people managing my sense of myself. It's acting with integrity. So do you think that's the type of relationship God eventually wants us to have with him? Is this... Mm relationship of independence, but yet we're dependent on him. How would you explain that? Well, I think, okay, so this is interesting. I think we grow up probably thinking the the goal is for me to be good and like be a good person and do all the right things. And we think of ourselves as like apart from God, like I'm going to prove that I'm good and I'm going to prove to God that I'm worth his love and I'm worth his goodness and I'm worth belonging to the group and I'm worthy. And we're looking at others and we're saying, well, they're not quite there yet. And we're a little bit of afraid of our own lack of worthiness, but we all want to hide behind it, right? We want to picture that I'm perfect and I belong. And he, and he offers covenant, right? Which is like, I, I remember the first time when I said, why covenant? Why not just a list of things to do? Like he could have just sent us down. God, our parents could have just sent us down with, do these things. Here's the list of things that you should do and be a good person. And there's like laws. And if you obey these laws, then good things happen. And so learn the laws, obey the laws, you'll get good things. And instead it's covenant. It's, it's not a list of things. It's relationship. And so why, why relationship? And in my own experience and what I can tell from research is we need relationship to grow. That's what family life teaches us. We're absolutely dependent on strong relationships to grow. And what the Lord offers us is a place to see ourselves in truth and be absolutely loved at the same time, not hiding, not trying to feign perfection. He says, take the masks off. I'm here. I know you. I see you. I know what you're struggling with. 
and I will wrap you up and I'll help you see yourself in honesty within a relationship of love where you don't have to hide in shame. And I, through that love, will enable you to change and grow. And so there's Moroni saying it's perfection in Christ. It was never like an isolated individual who's righteous on our own. It always happens, I think, as President Nelson keeps teaching us, the deeper I come in relationship with Christ, that is where perfection is. Not flawlessness, but a completion in him, a healing in him, a oneness with him. I actually love that way to look at a covenant. It's kind of a really interesting twist on the word covenant. It seems like you kind of are using the term relationship Mm -hmm. intermixed with covenant. Mm -hmm. I always do that because to me, that's what it is. I growing up, if someone had said, keep the commandments, keep your covenants, I would have seen them as exactly the same thing. Like there was no difference. It was like a list of things you do. And President Nelson has blown it up. He's completely blown that up. I think when he talks about Old Testament language, chesed love, it's God in relationship. And what he says over and over again is, I want to be in relationship with you. I will never leave you. I will never leave you. I will be with you. I will walk the path with you. I will bind myself to you, whatever state you're in. And with me, yoke to me, you'll, you'll become all that you yearn to become. So would you describe a covenant as like a radical dependence? Totally. And I don't think we do it well. I don't think I do it well, Catherine. Well, tell me, tell me why you don't. So I love that Sister Johnson in her conference talk just recently, she said, you remember she's talking about the backpack and like the mm-hmm. loads yeah. and that Jesus Christ is relief. And it's like she's saying to us, he is relief. And we're all carrying around all this burden and trying to be all the stuff we're supposed to be and do the things. And we worry a lot about our worthiness and am I enough and do I belong? And she said in there, she said about herself, I want to go at it alone. My pride makes me want to go at it alone. And I think so I could go throughout the day. I didn't treat my children the way I wanted to. I didn't respond in this way to this other person. I didn't take care of that thing. And the natural human is to go into a place of shame. I'm not good enough. I should be better. And so then we run from God. Like naturally we, it's, we're afraid. And he keeps saying, come, come, come. It's in me. It's in me. Almost like the more we love him, It's not even about overcoming all our weaknesses all the time. It's actually living with our weaknesses because we have so much trust in him. Because I've worked on the same things over and over again for forever. And I think sometimes he's telling me, this was actually not about you overcoming all those things, Jenna. It's about you trusting that I love you and I'm enough and you'll become enough. And there's actually some process of you being willing to be with me in your imperfection. That is what I need you to feel. And, and so I, I just think we, at least me, I, my yeah. nature is to say not to see in him relief, but to want to do it myself and prove that I'm enough and, and afraid, right. That he, he would be disappointed and, in, and I've got to do it myself, but he, he keeps saying it's in me. Keep coming. Love me. Just love me. And I, I think it's interesting that you said pride is sometimes what keeps us from that relationship with him. And whether it's pride or shame, I think that's two sides of the same coin, yes. right? Like, oh, I messed up, so I'm going to hide. Yeah. But it still comes from the fact that we think we shouldn't mess up, that we're yeah. okay to do it on our own. And there's something about us, like we have this beautiful culture. I think that we're hard workers and we're going to do it yes. and we're going to stick our shoulder to the wheel. But then I think we confuse that with earning our own salvation. And there's no way we can. That price has already been paid. But I think culturally, don't you think we think we need to earn it or we need to work hard to get it? And we think our our failures or our weaknesses or the hard things that happen in our lives are a mark of accusation. You didn't do it. You didn't do it right. Or you're not as good, right? 
And it's almost like, I just think we're getting more truth about that. The foundation actually is grace. Life is grace. Our living is grace. And loss and challenge is woven into the fabric of our lives because we're mortal. And his promises, it's not a mark that you have failed or you aren't enough or you somehow don't belong to the perfect group. But it's so I can walk with you. Not unlike the blind, you know, the man born blind when the Savior says to them, neither did this man sin nor his parents. The, the apostles are like, well, somebody did something wrong, obviously. And he says, not, neither, but that the works of God could be made manifest in him. And so it's like he's saying to us, let me work my miracles in you. Can you trust me enough to do that? As opposed to judging and seeing yourself as less than and that somehow these are marks of accusation or marks of belonging, successes and failures seen as instead it's welcome to life. I want to walk it with you. Well, and it was radical teaching back then, like that was radical, what the savior said. And I think it's interesting that you call it radical dependence. So is it maybe something that we need to understand a little bit more that he's teaching us that we belong to him and that's radical. Yeah. And Catherine, as you were talking, I was just thinking about all the feelings that are with a mother and who could capture it. Who could capture this juxtaposition of joy and sorrow and yearning and fulfillment? And it's all in there. And I was thinking about how natural it is for us to, in our earnestness, to be the best kind of mother and to do everything we're asked. And our children are the indication of our goodness as mothers, right? So natural for us to feel that way. And so we hide from one another. And yet covenant relationship with God, it never, and every covenant in the temple or baptism is never just this direction. Every single right. one is this direction as well. We're covenanting with one another. He says, yoke yourself to me. And then he says, bear one another's burdens. It's like he's saying, yoke yourselves to one another. But we struggle, right? Like we, our natural yeah. selves wants to hide and it's fearful to be seen. and known in all that we are not and all that we are, even though I think that's what God just keeps saying. And you actually mentioned something in your devotional that you said, I found that I could use our little ones to validate myself. It has been both enlightening and painful to see in myself our very human way of relating to others, seeking validation, selfishness, self-protection, blinding me from being able to actually see who others are what they truly need and what purity of love and doing what is best for them would look like. So, and you kind of touched on that earlier, but what do you mean using your children or even for those who don't have children using others or coworkers or family members to validate us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my experience with mothering, and then it just translates, as you said, to all relationships Yeah, is we're pretty fragile, insecure beings. And so I have a baby and I remember the first time I was comparing her, our daughter with the other baby, the same age and LaDawn was not crawling and, and all the anxiety that kind of came into my heart. And it was hard to see it in myself. Like, oh, she's not enough for me because I'm comparing who she is to this other child in this metric that I have. And I'm feeling like, oh, here's my worth walking out there outside of me in this child. And if she's not all these things, then I must not be enough sufficient. And so we can do it, right? Pressuring our children, wanting them to, right? Afraid of who they are, afraid of their journey, because when they walk into church in a certain way, then we're anxious about what it means about us. It's totally natural. It's totally human, but it's not love. And so it's interesting to, to kind of grow in what does it truly mean to love another soul? And I think that's in my work relationships, right? I can feel like comparing, I'm not this, or I'm not that, or wanting others to give me approbation so I can be okay. And so using relationships in a sense to help me feel validated as opposed to 
grounded in Christ, none of these things either change, take away, or add to who I am in that value. It's eternal. There's nothing that can make it bigger or less. It's divine and infinite. And so I don't have to use other people to be okay. None of it is actually solid anyway. I'm sure that's why he says, build your life on the rock. Everything else is broken. Everything else will crumble. But he is the rock of my identity. I mean, he's yearning for us to feel that. And, but it's very natural as human beings because we are shaped by others so much to use our relationships, to continue to use our relationships in ways that are for our own feelings of being okay. And he's trying to help us grow out of that in him so that we can purely love. And I'm still working on that as a mother. I work on it every day. So as your kids get older, how do you move away from that relationship, that validating? Because we want what's best for them, right? Like we want them to succeed and we want them to do well in school. And, and I don't want that to be a reflection of me, but I want that for them. Yes. So how do I move away from it validating and into this realm of knowing who they are? Yeah. And still helping them achieve who God created them to be. You just asked it so perfectly because we can be doing the same things from a very different heart. I can be encouraging LaDon and Peter to do their homework or to do well in their athletics or perform in their, you know, work hard in their music because I care about their character. And I have that responsibility as an older person who's walked ahead of that journey to know how important it is that they learn how to manage their emotions how important discipline is, how important their capacities to be kind are. That's a very different heart than my, oh, are you going to prove that I'm okay? Right? So I remember the first time when LaDon had a lower than an A grade. And I'm in that very moment of seeing, who is this about? Is it about her or is it about me? And I think whenever they do things that disappoint us, it's an opportunity to either rush in with judgment, which comes from a place of fear about what this is, or to rush in within a place of curiosity. Who are you and how can I help you to become truer and better to yourself? So do you think that's the most useful question to ask? Like if you find yourself in that situation, is that your first question, is this about you or is this about me? Okay. I wish it were always my first question. I think right, I but I... <laughs> because I do think that should be the question. It should be a question of curiosity about them. What hmm. are they trying to tell me about themselves? And it's going to hurt because there's some things I don't want to see. It's fearful. This is when they do wrong things, right? It can be fearful. Like, what are they telling me about our home or, or about themselves or their weaknesses? And, and we're afraid of it because it can hurt. But pure love, that grounded in Christ, it says, there's never an end. I'm always here. I'm always here helping them grow. You don't have to be afraid. Be open to them. Then it's, then it's an openness to what is it that you're trying to tell me about yourself? How can I help you? How can I help you from your place become good? That's mature, right? I am not that mature. I'm working on that, right? But it's but that is the the goal. So let's say you your first response is not the way you wish it would be. Yeah. What do you do then? Yeah. And this is what mothers are doing all the time, right? They right. They learn and they come back and they say I am so sorry. That was about me. It wasn't about you. I wasn't able to see you. I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to love you better. Help me to do that. And then I think it melts hearts, right? Because as parents, we get afraid of showing them our weaknesses. It's the best thing we can do. Because once we are able to do that, then they can be okay with their own, right? They're, which is real. They don't have to hide. Because they're not managing our sense of ourselves. They don't have to fake anything. They, they can trust this really is about growth. That's what mom cares about the very most. My honesty in this process of growth. 
my being okay with my fallibility because she's okay with her fallibility. And I just think that whole effort, I think God's trying to get us out of perfectionism, like massively, right? Cause it's yeah. a joke. It's like, it's a joke, but we're all playing it, you know? Like, yeah. And it's, it's so painful It's so and painful. it's not helpful if we can just get out of it. And, and I think that's the plan of salvation. And I like what you said that the whole work of the plan of salvation culminating in the great atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ is to enable us to become beings of love in the deepest form of connection with others. And Mm -hmm. that seems to to me, our goal and what we want to become is beings of love. What does it mean to be a being of love? Well, I think, Catherine beautiful, the things that we've been talking about, when I can be open with that child and I can say, I am sorry, that wasn't loving. It really was about me. Then we are in a place of really, truly learning how to love. It's the opposite. It's interesting. I think we often think pride is the opposite of humility, but I think pride is really the opposite of charity because pride is me managing my image It's me managing my image to myself and my image to others. And as if I could do that, right? We think we can. And charity is a willingness to be open, trusting in the love of Christ, like so, so sure of his love for you, so deeply sure that he is charity and he is love, and he loves you through the weaknesses that will not go away in this life. In fact, he wants you to know, I actually want you to know it's okay to hang on, to have those because I'm still here and I love you. And that somehow that experience is what allows us to truly love because we're no longer hiding. We, we can be in relationship to others with their weaknesses, with our weaknesses in that I'll just quote, a beautiful author who says perfection is not possible. Intimacy is. And intimacy is perfection, ironically. It's the willingness to be seen, known, loved. The willingness to see and know and love that is perfection. That is intimacy. That is heaven. I love that definition of intimacy. And if we take that definition of intimacy How has that changed your relationship with Jesus Christ? It's everything. And I know he loves me as I am. I think that just so beautiful to know he yearns to walk every step. He yearns for me to come and say, this is hard. I'm struggling. He yearns for me to just turn to him and almost like turn my life, my weaknesses over to him in this moment and the next moment and the next moment. And, and no, that is, that is the whole purpose of it all. It was never about me trying to be all the stuff. It was always about me knowing I could trust him. I could trust him to walk the journey and love me. So it's everything. It's, it's so different than that. Trying to prove that I'm enough, trying to prove that I belong, trying to prove that I'm worthy. It's, it's just love, right? It's like, it's like Lehi. He's like saying, come taste the fruit. Just come taste the fruit. It's here to be eaten. It's here to be received. Come taste it. And he will walk it. He will walk it. Love, bless, help us, heal us. I love how you call that radical dependence. Because I truly believe if we feel that, if we understand that, if we and understand our relationship with our Savior in those eyes and in that way, then our whole lives will be different, radically different. And I think that is the only reason why I'm teaching seminary yeah. <laughs> is because I want those kids to know that they are loved and that they are enough just as they are. And I just have never thought of it before as teaching them that they are dependent on. Jesus Christ, that that covenant relationship brings about a dependence. Thanks for teaching them, Catherine. Well, I have one more question for you. We love to end each episode with a small and simple challenge 
something that we can take away from this conversation and try and think about or work on or implement through the week. So what would be your small and simple challenge this week to help us become more connected with God? So in our stake, we have been understanding, trying to come to understand the meaning of covenant relationship. So I like to share these statements with the women that I'm around. These come from Ann Voskamp, a wonderful Christian who I think understands well this beautiful relationship with Christ. Today is not about maintaining control of everything. It's about maintaining your gaze on him. Today is not about straining for perfection in everything. It's about reaching for the perfect one through everything. The accomplishment of a day isn't so much about accomplishing goals, but about abiding in God. His invitation to me is to still long enough and let go of all the fears and worries that have a hold of me so that he can hold me. In repentance and rest is salvation. In quietness and trust is my strength. The way through any sea is to have eyes to see him who walks on ways. Can you trust that what looks like a wave to carry you away is the wave that will carry you to shore? Can I trust that what is coming at me is really God coming for me? Can I trust that the one who walks on waves will make a highway out of everything that rises in my way? Fixing my attention on God in the everyday things begins to profoundly fix the problems of all the everyday things. So for me, it's meant really trusting him, the way maker. He is the bread, the light, the water. He wants me to know that every day, that he will be that for me, for our children, for my family, for my relationships, for my students, for my life. And I think that relief, that's what Sister Johnson's pleading us to know. He is relief. So do you read that every morning? I try to go through those thoughts every morning. Powerful. Thank you so much. This has been such an enlightening conversation. Thank you, Catherine. That was such a great conversation with Janet. I am going to look at my covenants in a whole new way, that they are actually ways to strengthen and deepen and radicalize my relationship with my Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here and hop on over to Instagram at Magnify Community for more inspiration and conversation. And of course, subscribe and listen to the Magnify podcast wherever you get your shows. See you next week.